Philippe, and thank you for Frank Bold for coordinating such a wonderful uh, project that will be presented today. And uh, indeed, it's, a, it's an honor to be here together with my colleague Lara to open this event. And um, uh, I'm convinced that this year will bring big changes in the agenda that we are all very interested in. Um, because all the dots uh, we have drawn on the map seem to be connecting. And not only that, I also think that we are under lucky stars. The stars are aligned just at this moment. Um, President Ursula von der Leyen's commission has set the delivery of the sustainable development goals as one of their priorities. Um, but reaching and fulfilling the SDGs is a Herculean task. It means that the EU needs to transform its economy from resource wasteful into resource efficient. It means that the EU, all of us included, need to rethink the value creation, how it could be done both socially and environmentally sustainably. And this means that we absolutely have not done enough. We need to be much, much more ambitious. Um, dear friends, President von der Leyen's commission is not even 100 days old, but so far the commission seems to be ready to deliver. On the non-financial directive, uh, two weeks ago, Executive Vice President Dombrovskis announced that later this year he will present a renewed sustainable finance strategy, which will include a revision of the non-financial reporting directive. And I know that many of you have been thinking hard on how it should be revised. The companies are required to increase disclosure on their sustainable activities and give reliable information on both risks and opportunities. This legislation will be complemented with clear reporting standards for non-financial information. And I think it was uh, very, very good news that uh, Commissioner Vice President Dombrovskis indeed announced that we need um, a standard on the basis of uh, several existing standards, obviously. Um, because um, hopefully then there will be less overlapping international reporting standards. The work has already started. As a first step, the Commission published a roadmap and an inception impact assessment that will be followed by a public consultation and finally, at the end of this year, a decision on the legislative proposal. Secondly, on the human rights due diligence. It is at least as interesting and exciting to see what the Commission will propose on the human rights due diligence. Um, last week in Strasbourg, in our session in the European Parliament, Commissioner Dali, um, uh, who had um, uh, the po possibility to respond to a, a resolution which was dealing with uh, child labour in Madagascar mining industry, um, she made it very clear that the EU cannot tolerate a situation where children are forced to work in horrendous conditions. Supply chain due diligence is the essential element in the eradication of child labour. I also couldn't believe my ears. Actually, I couldn't hear because the, the plenary was very noisy at that time, so I had to check afterwards if I really had heard right. And Commissioner Dali announced that the Commission will shortly publish a study on due diligence requirements through the supply chain. And according to her, this study examines both existing regulation and proposals, as well as options for regulating due diligence in companies, own operations, and through the supply chain to adverse human rights and environmental impacts. Uh, the Commissioner went as far as saying that in a single market it is not practical to have different national treatments and the benefits of an EU-wide framework are obvious in terms of levelling the playing field and creating legal certainty for companies. This is really music to my ears. Uh, so Justice Commissioner Reinders will come to the Legal Affairs Committee of the European Parliament this week on the 20th, that's Thursday. Um, it's a public meeting, so please, if you're interested, um, he will um, certainly say something about these studies which will be published. The study will be published on that day. And uh, I look very much forward to hearing more about the study and the Commission's plans. Uh, now, today, the Alliance for Corporate Transparency will present their research on the state of corporate sustainability reporting in the EU. This day focuses on the central role of companies and companies reporting in the fields of sustainable finance and corporate governance and its connection with the Sustainable Finance Action Plan. 
It was not so long time ago when a topic like this may not have drawn such a big room of audience, but here we are, packed to the rafters. Corporate sustainability and transparency are definitely the talk of the town. For me, it has been very clear for some time that the private sector is ready to pull its weight and even more. Sustainability means that we need to turn current global challenges into a global change. And this transition simply is not possible without the private sector. And this is also something that Vice President Dombrovsky said when he announced the work on, on the standard. At the same time, the Alliance for Corporate Transparency Research tells us that there is a lot to do. For instance, when the specificity of companies' disclosure of their policies, risks and outcomes was examined, it was found out that only 24 to 26 percent of companies were able to provide specific descriptions of their policies and risks related to human rights. This means that per every company that is describing and disclosing their human rights policies and risks, there are three companies who are not doing so. And it also seemed to me that um, uh, the fact that only less than 8% have remedies for, for breaches of human rights in place is really uh, very, very uh, uh, urgently uh, needing uh, action. So it seems that companies are, at, are better at recognizing human rights risks than reporting on what they are doing to those risks. So um, I think that the Alliance of, for Corporate Transparency's work is of utmost importance. The creation of sustainable finance, a sustainable economy, requires that we must be able to improve companies' performance on all areas, environmental, social, and governance. But as long as we don't have reliable information, there can be no level playing field between companies. And this is also one of the lessons I'm discovering from this study of uh, Alliance for Corporate Transparency. So we need to be able to distinguish which companies are performing better than others, and not just in financial terms, but also in non-financial terms, environmental, social, and governance. So finally, with a view to all the ongoing developments, this research, this event, and all the work the Alliance for Corporate Transparency is doing helps us to pinpoint which are the right problems, right problems to solve and right questions to ask. How to build a system of corporate reporting that effectively integrates investors' duties, directors' duties, and corporate responsibility into a seamless design that serves both the purpose of the company as well as the society and the world around it. So thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to be here. I wish you an excellent event. Well, thank you very much, Heidi. And Lara, it's now your turn. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having us here today. I'm very happy to be here, and especially in the company of my colleague Heidi, who's been working on responsible business conduct for a long time. Um, and to dive straight in, I'll start maybe with an anecdote for those who don't read Belgian newspapers. In December, it was reported that the building right next door here, the egg building, um, although the architects actually say it's not an egg, it's a lantern, uh, but that that building was partly constructed by undocumented workers. In the subcontracting chain, there were workers from Brazil, from Bulgaria, from Moldova, from Morocco, and some of those were put to work without employment contracts. Some of those workers were paid in cash or they weren't paid at all, and they didn't have social security coverage, presumably to avoid liability claims. In other words, they were exploited. And it's of course baffling and outrageous to see that a situation such as this can arise in the heart of our European project. My colleague Agnes Jongeri is from the Employment Committee, immediately called for a remedy for those workers and for stronger rules on social dumping. I myself brought up the practices in the Budgetary Control Committee. Because apparently behind the main contractor of the council there were 12 subcontractors who in turn subcontracted. And of course, looking into an entire chain of subcontractors is a huge task. And that makes me pause and wonder. 
Because if abuse and negligence can take place here, right here in our own backyard, then of course it can happen in any EU jurisdiction, and indeed anywhere in the world. As long as there's no clear and binding disincentive against environmental, social, and human right abuses, there's room for businesses that prefer the P of profit over the P of people and planet. And therefore, we must create an overarching and mandatory framework against exploitation. Not only the exploitation of employees, but also the exploitation of the environment and of natural resources within and outside the EU. And that's especially key in the context of the Green Deal, as businesses can play a decisive role in avoiding ecological escalation and also because our transition to green energy will continue to require resources, for instance, batteries for electric vehicles. And therefore, as part of any green deal, we must increase the transparency and sustainability of global supply chains. The good news is that momentum seems to be emerging. Or as Heidi said, the stars are aligning. Maybe that's more pretty. In December, as you're of course aware, 100 civil society organizations called for EU human rights and environmental due diligence legislation. But that's not the only thing that's happening in terms of momentum. Customers and employees have increasingly high standards for the company they buy from and work for. And as examples, Workers at Amazon, for instance, more than 8,700 of them signed a list of demands for their CEO, including getting to zero emissions and eliminating donations to climate deniers. And on the consumer side, the appetite for sustainability marketed products is growing. Huge amounts of young people are taking to the streets, and a global survey from Deloitte showed that up to 87% of the under 40s crowd so the millennials who will make up 75% of the global workforce in five years, that they believe that a company's success should be measured in more than only financial terms. And nine in 10 members of Generation Z agree that companies have a responsibility to engage with environmental and social issues. And in terms of momentum, there's calls from business itself to do good with recent examples that I'm sure you've all read from BlackRock and Goldman Sachs. There have been 200 large multinationals in the US who together via the business roundtable said that they'll no longer solely uh, focus on shareholders and on the short run, but that they're committed to transparency and that they'll deal fairly and ethically with their suppliers. But those well-intentioned initiatives are, of course, still niche, not mainstream. And however laudable, Goldman Sachs and BlackRock can still not be called sustainable firms. Many of the efforts we see are partial and fragmented, and there's a gap between what companies say and what they do, as you very rightly point out in your report. As recently as 2016, McKinsey found in a survey that half of the managers of big corporations looked no further than three years ahead, and 80% of them were primarily concerned with short-term profit. This type of quarterly capitalism brings businesses at odds with our Green Deal and with the Sustainable Development Goals. And for a real mindset shift and the mainstreaming of sustainability, I think political leadership is now required. And Commissioner Reinders was very right in his hearing when he said that the time for voluntary standards for corporations is over. Voluntary standards are good for the good guys. And what we need now is a system that's also bad for the bad guys. And I think such a system should have multiple elements, multiple layers to it. And the first layer in that system is the mandatory disclosure of information. We've had the non-financial disclosure directive in place for a few years now. And I agree with all the assessments that regret the narrow scope of the NFRD, both in terms of information requirements and the number of companies that it covers. But even so, I think it's an important piece of legislation because it's forced over 6,000 of the biggest companies that operate in Europe to look beyond profit in their annual reports, to consider not only value, but values. The second layer is the mainstreaming of corporate sustainability reporting. 
We need to standardize data, make it comparable, and make it accessible to the public, to make investors consider ESG risks before they include a company into their portfolios. And this requires an upgrade of the NFRD, of course, that I'm very happy uh, we know is coming. And if we can achieve that upgrade, and with the precious help of NGOs and trade unions and journalists, we may then be able to bring more cases of exploitation to light, as well as push investors, consumers, or clients to distance themselves from any rotten apples. And then again, information is only one dimension of the problem. We know that some companies, including Shell, Philip Morris, and BP, get rich from making people dependent on harmful products. We know that BNP Paribas, RWE, and Samsung have been embroiled in human rights or environmental scandals, and that in spite of those, they've been able to carry on. So however necessary transparency is, it's so far been insufficient to enforce real behavioral change of large companies. And so for that, I think we need an extra layer, that of due diligence. And here comes the textbook definition, an overarching and mandatory framework to avoid, mitigate, and report on sustainability risks and impacts, so that social, environmental, and governance risks can be avoided in the entire supply chain. And what's not to like, you might say, well, as always, I'm sure, some vested interests will say that mandatory due diligence will have unintended consequences, that it will be too burdensome, too costly, too prescriptive, too disruptive, not business friendly. But I think that's a huge straw man, because indeed, if designed poorly, these laws can be disproportionate and burdensome. But this is the case for any law. And I used to work in a law firm, and I've heard MEPs refer to as clowns more than once, but I can assure you that flawed design is not inherent to EU legislation or to European due diligence legislation. And I think there's evidence that due diligence as a concept is gaining traction on its own already. A number of EU countries today already have some kind of due diligence legislation in place. Over 2,000 companies have signed up to the UN principles of responsible investment and adopted the OECD guidance for responsible business conduct. Academic evidence is piling up that companies that have in place due diligence policies have higher risk adjusted returns than their competitors. And it goes to show that short termism and quarterly capitalism is not only devastating for people and planet, it's ultimately not conducive to profit either. It seems to me that current OECD due diligence guidance offers welcome clarity and that it supports companies that are transitioning to responsible business conduct. And if done well, enshrining this guidance into EU law will not only create a level playing feet, uh, field, it will elevate the level playing field. <coughs> the fourth and last element, I think, for an effective system that we need on responsible responsible business conduct is remedy. Uh, currently, Heidi and I both actually are shadows for the European system for collective redress. And that system is long overdue. Millions of European citizens currently don't have access of any kind uh, to class action to seek redress for damage that companies may have inflicted. And I'm confident that the final outcome of the negotiations will mean a step forward for European consumers, although, although we'll also need to make sure that there's access for victims from third countries. I hope that that overview, that this kickoff has given you an idea um, of how I see things at EU level. There are some things that I haven't mentioned here that I'm sure will be discussed throughout the day. For instance, the revision of the IFRS that we want, or that I assume a lot of the attendants here today want um, to make publish what you pay a reality, a revision of the audit regulation to make large accountancy offices behave responsibly too. I'm sure those are all things that we'll come back to later. My remarks are a, a bird's eye view, and I'm very happy to sit back after this and listen to experts on all of these issues uh, to go more into more detail 
uh, and I really hope that in the next months and years we'll be able to work together. I'm very optimistic about what we can achieve in the next years, and I look forward to the rest of the day here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lara. Thank you, Heidi. There is a lot of interesting things coming to Europe in, uh, in, the, in, this, in this term of the European Commission. That's, that's what I heard you saying, and I think we can rely on you taking a leadership in the European Parliament and making these, these upcoming changes actually happen and in a way that actually works for, well, environment, human rights, and the corporations hopefully alike. <laughs> please, please hide. I um, wanted to tell you also that Commissioner Reinders has uh, agreed to come to the Parliament on the 4th of March to a meeting organized by our Responsible Business Conduct Working Group to, to discuss the studies that is now coming on the 20th. So um, it, this is an announcement. If you are interested, so just look at our website, uh, responsiblebusinessconduct.eu, and you will find everything there, if not today, then tomorrow latest. So at 1 o'clock on the 4th of March, the Commissioner will be there to discuss. Oh, excellent. Thank you. We'll move to the presentation of the, of the, of the, of the results, and we would love to be in touch. <laughs>